um, there are different people in the world. Some people, they make things happen, and some people, they watch things happen, and some people then say, what happened? Um, this morning, the goal is that uh, we see what happens so that we can then make things happen, okay? Uh, we want to learn from Stephen. We want to learn from the, the message that he delivers, the confidence that he has, the boldness to proclaim the truth, and um, we want to do the same. Uh, if you remember from last week and previous weeks who Stephen was, Stephen was um, first caring for widows. He became a servant within the church, and then he rose to become a, more of a prominent figure that God would use, and God used him in a number of different ways. But here, um, we have kind of the, um, the, the apex of Stephen's life, which ends up being Stephen's death. And it's incredible to see how God uses, um, uses Stephen through this, um, this incredible uh, uh, sermon that he gives. Um, before we get into our text, we're going to be in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, is where we'll start. I encourage you to follow along. We're going to make our way through chapter 8 and verse 4 this morning. Um, before we read our text, uh, let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to study your word this morning. And Father, I pray that you would help us as we seek to learn from the, from your word, um, as we seek to learn from the life of Stephen, as, uh, as he spoke, um, these words inspired by your Holy Spirit, recorded for us by Luke. We have uh, the privilege of being able to see your hand at work in Stephen's life and in Stephen's death. I pray that this morning you would use this passage to challenge our hearts. I pray that we might be um, convicted if we need conviction. And I pray that we might be encouraged if, uh, if that is what is needed. And um, In any case, uh, this morning, I pray that you would just sharpen us and make us more more useful. Um, help us to be able to serve you uh, more fully, more completely, um, because of the time we spend with you and in your word this morning. I pray that you'd help me as I speak. Help me to say the things that you would want me to say. Help me to be able to um, think clearly and communicate clearly the truth of your word. I pray that as your word is received, that you would help each of us not to uh, not to get distracted. Help us to be able to have um, ears to hear, eyes to see. Give us a soft heart that we might quickly and easily apply the truths that are found in this passage. I pray that you would um, help me not to say anything that would distract from that, from your truth. I pray that you'd help me not to say anything that would be um, be foolish. I pray that you would guide in our time this morning. And uh, I pray that what would re be the ultimate um, result of this this morning would be that we would be worshiping. As we recognize your worth through, um, through the way that we handle and study your word. God, I pray that uh, you would be worshipped through both the the preaching and the hearing of your word. Guide us uh, that we might worship you in a manner that is um, as acceptable to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to worship you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 51. Um, that's where I'll start reading, and um, then we'll go back and start to break it down um, verse by verse after we read it. Acts chapter 7, verse 51 says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Now, we're jumping right in, right? Okay, so last week I gave you like the all the, the biblical sermon that he gave, right? And I feel like I need to give you a little background to remind you, right? So um, he is, he's responded to their accusations. He 
uh, finds the common ground. He figures out, oh, they're you know these are um, Jewish people, and so I'm going to hit them with all of this information that they they should know. And then he gives them a very biblical answer. As he goes through his sermon, he quotes uh, passage after passage. And then he takes this opportunity to point out the error and ultimately declare the gospel. And so what happens in verse 51 is like the, um, it's, it, it was, uh, so it's like the, um, the peak of his sermon, right? It's like he's given all this information, and now he's going to deal that um, a killing blow. Right? He's just going to hit them where, where it hurts. Okay, and So that's what we find in 51. I feel like jumping into verse 51, you're like, ah, okay, what's, this, this is big. Okay, We're jumping right into the biggest part of his sermon. All right? uh, can I communicate that in any other way? This is huge. This is the point in his sermon where they become so enraged that this is what provokes them to want to kill him. Okay, So that's where we are in this message, in this Uh, in the communication of the truth by Stephen. He has just laid out why he is not blaspheming the law, not blaspheming God and Moses, not blaspheming the the, the tabernacle, but he has confronted them as being those who blasphemed all of those different areas. All right, so we get to verse 51. He says, You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, He gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went and well, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Verse 1 of chapter 8. And on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. This is, um, as I mentioned, the climax of Stephen's life, and it is also uh, his, his death. So the first thing that we're going to see this morning is the rebuke. The rebuke. Stephen points out the error in their heart. Remember, he is brought before the council. He's brought before um, the... Uh, the um, the supreme um, <laughs> governing body, and his life is put in their hands. And he has given this declaration of him not being a blasphemous, but then he turns the tables on them, and he says, you men are stiff-necked. He says, You're, you slept bad last night. That's what he's pointing out, that, these, that he knew something special, that they didn't know how to sleep. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, right? <laughs> they're stiff-necked. What that means is that they're prideful. They're, they're haughty. They're arrogant. This is, this is the men that he's dealing with. There are these prideful men that are so stiff-necked, they are unwilling to budge. They're rigid in the way that they see themselves and the way they see this religious system that they themselves are a part of. And he says, you're prideful, 
and you're uncircumcised in heart and your ears, they're always resisting the Holy Spirit. Uncircumcised in heart and ears. They could not understand what they were hearing because they had a heart problem. They couldn't understand what they were hearing. They had this uncircumcised heart. It means that their heart had not been set apart as holy or had not been given to God. And therefore, they're always resisting the Holy Spirit. And then Stephen gives them an example. He's given them a number of examples, right? He's talked about how they rejected Moses and how they rejected Joseph and how they, their track record is not that great for knowing what is good. And then he goes a little bit further, and in verse 52, he says, Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? He says, Look, all the people that we, that we hold as precious and that we say we're going to follow their teaching, your fathers, your, they were persecuted because of that. He says, that you're, This people um, that's supposed to be the people of God are so arrogant that they, they miss what this means. They've rejected Joseph, they rejected Moses, and now he says you, they rejected the prophets. And uh, it's interesting, I think, um, in Hebrews, this idea of having a hard heart gets addressed. In Hebrews chapter 3, I'm going to read for you um, verse 12 through 15. The author of Hebrews says, Take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you, um, that there not be in any one of you an evil unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long it is, as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. All it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. <coughs> do not harden your hearts uh, the author of Hebrews also referencing what took place um, while the children were wandering in the wilderness. They constantly had this, um, this difficulty in following what God wanted them to do. And so, the author of Hebrews also admonishes us not to harden our hearts. These men, they were resisting the Holy Spirit. had hardened their heart. And we see some application here. And this simple application is that pride will distort the truth of reality. When you're arrogant, when you're prideful, it's very difficult for you to see what is presented before you. It's very difficult for you to understand um, reality. And that's what these men were dealing with. They were having a difficulty understanding who Jesus was, why Stephen would be saying the things that he's saying. I remember um, counseling with a couple one time. They had, uh, they had met with me, and they were from uh, you know some other some other church. And um, they came in, and the wife was just so like eager and wanting to learn and wanting to change. And the husband came in. He's like, I got it all figured out. And he like laid out what he's doing, what he's not doing, and this is kind of his plan, his system. This is the way he works. And um, the pridefulness of his heart would not allow him to see the error within his marriage, the problems within his marriage, the problems within the way that he was dealing with his wife. And uh, so uh, we did not make it very far uh, in, that, in that process. It was one of those things I was like, oh, man. Because you can see the error sometimes so blatantly, so clearly. But with prideful people, they will, they will deny it. They'll dismiss it. They won't see it. And so you don't make any progress. That's what happened here. They, these, uh, the council has denied it. They're not seeing this problem. They're um, unable to see. All right? And so um, I think it's interesting, too. Let me just point out. When Stephen gave this message, he um, regularly associates with them. Right? It's just like the little, little tag on, right? It's interesting that at verse 51, things change, and he no longer associates with them. He now says, you men who are stiff-necked. And he continues, and he just points out that this is who they are. He says, they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one. And so he, he distances himself from them as, at this point, recognizing who Jesus was, and them not recognizing him as the Messiah. And so he says... Uh, verse, um, as he continues 
Um, in verse 52, he says, Which one of you, uh, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one. He says, So they were the ones who killed those who are announcing the righteous one. And now you, who, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. He says, You now are the betrayers and the murderers. Now, this is what everyone loves to hear, right? So he points out the error in their understanding that they had killed those, um, uh, killed the one who was previously announced, and they had killed the uh, the prophets who were announcing the righteous one. This isn't the first time that this title is used, the righteous one. I'm just pointing this out because um, it's interesting to see the the same reaction in Acts chapter three, um, in verse fourteen. He is referred to as the righteous one. And still, as, as Peter gives this, um, this sermon, they still um, reject, reject that message. And um, yeah, as that continues on, uh, Stephen echoes that sentiment that this is the righteous one. Peter uses the same title. It says, now you have become the betrayers and murderers of the righteous one. They were given the law, but they did not keep it. Um, they did not recognize the one who would fulfill the law. And so it's at this point that they can no longer contain their anger, right? So he has, he's pulled out his sword, he's used it, he's poked them, and now they're mad. Very angry. They can no longer contain their anger. And we see that the, the result of this message now erupts in verse 54. And uh, so we'll see the result. We see that they rejected Stephen's message. And as we go through this text, you're, what you're going to see is kind of this contrast between the way that Stephen acts and the way that uh, the, the council, uh, the Jewish men, the way that they, they react. And we'll see that as we go. But We'll see the rejection of his message, the reception of Stephen by Jesus. And then we see this progress to the ravaging of the church as this persecution spreads um, by Saul and then the preaching of the church. Um, the church continues to proclaim the gospel as it scatters. So the result. Um, verse 54. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. They began gnashing their teeth at him. And then we'll skip to verse 57, and we see more of what they do, how they reject. Verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice, and covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside the robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So first, they, they're gnashing their teeth at him. Um, when they heard Stephen's rebuke, they were, uh, as it says, cut to the quick. Literally, they were torn in half. They were ripped apart. They, they had experienced that, um, that poke, right? And in, instead of having this humble response and saying, oh, what, what must we do, as some in the past have done in Acts, they get angry. They begin gnashing their teeth at him. They're so furious and so angry that they are, they just can't wait to get their hands on him, right? Full of anger. It's one of those contrasting points where we see them being full of anger, where Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit, as it uh, says in verse 50, um, 56. Um, excuse me, 55. And so they gnashing their teeth, they then 57, they covered their ears, they scream, and they run at him, covering their ears, as if they're trying to do something noble. As if they're trying to hide their ears from such blasphemy. This is how a darkened heart responds. They run at him, they rush him. This is the, the same word that is used to speak of the demon-possessed swine who rush over the cliff. Like they're just there's no um, no control no restraint it's with one impulse and this anger has taken over and they're just going at him. In verse fifty eight, 
they began stoning him. They drove him out of the city. The witnesses laid aside their robes. And some, you know, some debate whether this was an, uh, just done by an enraged mob, mob or if it was done as uh, something that was done lawfully. Um, there's a few reasons why we should think it was done lawfully. Uh, they're doing it according to Leviticus 24. Uh, Leviticus 24 tells them to do it outside the city. Secondly, it says that the consequence for blasphemy was stoning. We also, um, in the Mishnah, this is um, uh, the codification of the Jewish oral laws. Uh, it says in the Mishnah that they were to, to drop one into a pit to be stoned, and that pit had to be twice their height, so 10 to 12 foot, and they would drop them into that pit. And if they fell into that pit and died, great. But if not, they were given the um, instruction that they were to flip the person over on their back, and then the person who had the witness, whoever was the witness that had brought this accusation against him, was to pick up the largest stone they could find and drop it right on their chest. That was what was supposed to happen. Now Stephen, he was a um, strong man, and so that first stone didn't kill him. There was others that joined in and, and killed him by throwing more stones on top of him. And so this is, um, this, they're following uh, even the law that would be a more common, uh, common practice. So they remove their ropes, apparently to throw stones more freely. They're getting ready for this, right? You kind of see them not wanting to hold anything back. They're angry. They're, they're upset. And... You can almost picture them like warming up their shoulders as they're ready to throw these stones at Stephen. As they're taking their coats off to make sure that they get every bit of effort into this as they can. In verse 55 and 56, and then in 59 through 60, we see the reception of Stephen by Jesus. The reception of Jesus uh, of Stephen by Jesus. Stephen gazes into heaven. Verse 55, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So here's Stephen, he's looking into heaven and these men are looking at Stephen and they're ready to kill him. There's a big contrast between those two. He's looking towards life with Jesus. They're looking towards his death. And so he gazes into heaven, and uh, this isn't um, a phrase that's not used. We, we see it even in Acts chapter 1, right, when Jesus ascends into heaven, and they're standing there, and they're gazing into heaven. But what he sees is what's interesting. He sees the glory of God, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I think what Stephen here, sees here is this, um, the, I think he sees the Shekinah, I think he sees the glory of God as he looks up into heaven, and uh, this glorious light, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. There are not many people that are in this group to have said that they have seen the glory of God. Stephen now, we know very little about him, but this is what we know about him is, is very impactful, not only as we look at this chapter, but as we look at the Bible as a whole. Those in that group, to name a few, are Ezekiel, Isaiah, Peter, James, and John, and Moses, and now Stephen is lumped into those who have seen, and seen the glory of God. It's interesting to mention that Jesus we may expect to see sitting at the right hand of God. But he is seen standing at the right hand of God. We know that he is to be sitting there. question is, why is he standing? The text doesn't tell us, right, why he's standing. Personally, I think that this is Jesus welcoming Stephen into glory. And so Stephen, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, he speaks these words. And at the exact same time as he's speaking these words, he's confirming for this exact same group, this group that heard Jesus, what he said he would, where he said he would be, right? 
So the same group that's killing Stephen is the group that killed Jesus, that um, persecutes Jesus, that uh, holds, holds this trial for Jesus. And in Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and 62, it says, Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And it's at that point that they decide they, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill Jesus. I think they probably decided before, but that was the evidence that they needed so that they then could kill him. And here's Stephen, the same group. He says, you know what? I see Jesus. And he is at the right hand of God. Confirming that Jesus was where he said he would be. Can you imagine how angry and enraged these people might be? At this point, like on top of, they're already angry. And now they hear this same words that Jesus spoke. Whom they previously had killed. So in verse 59, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Notice he's not asking God to keep him from having to spend a long time in purgatory, right? He's not saying, hey, God, make, let me get to you quickly. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He says, Lord Jesus, you receive my spirit. So falling to his knees, he cries out with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. What is he doing here? Well, he's echoing what Jesus had said. And he, I think, is praying for their forgiveness. He's praying for their forgiveness. And you remember, Stephen was full of a number of things, right? He was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of wisdom. He was full of power. It's also mentioned that he is full of grace. And the question was, what does it mean to be full of grace? And it, it could very well be, be um, referring to the grace that has been extended to him by way of salvation. It could be speaking of that salvific grace, but it may also be referring to the temperament of Stephen and being a gracious person. And I think that we see that grace poured out on these people as he prays for their forgiveness as he is being killed by them. So he prays for their forgiveness, just like Jesus did. Were there any that were forgiven? Did any turn from their error? Well, we know of at least one person that was there that day that was forgiven, that turned from their error. And that was this young man, verse 58, named Saul. Now Saul, he ramps up his charge against the church. After this event takes place, we come into verse 1 of chapter 8. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so Saul then comes to the spotlight where he begins to persecute the church. So he kind of moves from more of a bystander to one who's in, uh, he's heartily uh, agreeing with them, and now he's actively persecuting the church, pursuing the church. And on that day, the church gets persecuted. They scatter. They spread. There's some devout men that hang around. They take care of Stephen's body. They make this uh, loud lamentation over him. They bury him. I just point out, it's a good thing to mourn. It's a good thing to mourn the loss of faithful men and women. These men mourn the loss of Stephen. And preaching continues as the church scatters. The Saul begins ravaging the church. That word ravaging is an expression used to describe wild beasts tearing at flesh. That's the picture that is depicted as he goes from house to house, tearing things apart, looking for these Christians, arresting men and women. House to house. Possibly he's going from house church to house church. 
persecuting the church. And as those who were scattered, they went about, and they went about preaching the word. And this is what God does. This is a seemingly horrific, um, depressing story. A story of pride and anger. But that, that story about that pride and anger is also a story about the spread of the gospel. Right? Right? With Stephen? The question is, to what extent? How far does the gospel spread at this point? What happens with those who were um, involved in uh, part of this event? We see, let me give you some spoilers, right? We're going to look forward. In chapter 9, Saul is converted. And you better believe that Stephen was a clear memory for him as the Lord appears to him, and he is also struck with this great light, right? Blindness now. And uh, the Lord gets his attention, right? And so now the Lord uses Saul. And you better bet on his mind was the things that he had done, uh, things that Stephen would have taught, said. We also see in chapter 11 that there were those who spread... And spread out as they're teaching and preaching. And in verse 19 it says, So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. These, uh, these regions where the gospel would then go forth. The church in Antioch then in chapter 11 gets established. Do you know what God does with the church in Antioch? It's like one of the, the strongholds for the faith, and the missionaries get sent out from that church numerous times. Stephen's death causes people to flee to that area where people are saved. People are coming to know the Lord, and Barnabas is sent there, and he encourages the church. And then we find that uh, Barnabas and Saul, then in chapter 13, are sent out from Antioch. And then in verse 15, we see them back in Antioch. They just kind of keep going in and out of this, this area. Because of what happened in chapter 7. Because of Stephen's death, the church spreads. Yeah, it's a really bad thing, right? It's bad. Like, nobody enjoys persecution. At the same time, God had a much bigger plan in establishing the church and spreading the church. He told them it was going to go, right, and to the uttermost parts of the, of the world. And that's what happens. Let me give you some application, okay? This morning, as you're looking at this text, and you're saying, okay, what does this mean for me? I see the church. The church is growing. That's great. I'm a part of the church. Okay, I kind of see how that connects with me. Let me just, let me just point this out, okay? Um, bad things happen, right? Everybody, oh yeah, okay, sure, that's obvious. Bad things happen, but they're not always bad, okay? They're not always bad. In great sorrow, through the greatest pain, in, uh, in bearing that weight of discouragement, God is still doing something. Okay? And so the question might be today, uh, what is God doing in your life? What weight do you carry? What difficulty are you facing right now? What struggle is it that you're like, I want to get out of this as fast as I can. I, I want, this is not comfortable. Let me just encourage you that it's not for not, right? God is doing something in that. I don't know what it is, right? But he's doing something. And uh, that should be, um, that is an encouragement. It's an encouragement to me. I hope it's an encouragement to you. Um, let's pray together.
God, we are so thankful that you are so big that the greatest difficulty that we face, the hardest um, hardship, troubles, the problems of this life, God, I'm thankful that you are bigger than those and that you are able to work out um, what is best for us and what brings you the most glory. Father, I pray that you would help us as, uh, as we may have opportunities to stand up for the gospel as Stephen did. I pray that you'd help us to be bold in our proclamation of the truth. I pray that you would help us to be full of wisdom and your spirit and power and of grace. God, I pray that you would help us to um, be able to accurately um, clarify the gospel for the people around us. And, and Father, w when persecution comes, I pray that you would uh, give us the words to speak, even as uh, you gave Stephen those words to speak. Father, I think about uh, you standing for uh, seemingly to receive Stephen. Um, I pray that you would help us to also live a life that is um, something that is pleasing to you. I thank you that we have a future hope, that this life is not the end, and that we have a hope of being with you. Father, I thank you that uh, we have no reason to fear what men can do to us. Because you have given us that uh, sure hope of being with you. Father, I pray that you would help us to keep the right kind of perspective as we face different challenges from day to day. Even as we go into this next week, I pray that you would help us to have the right kind of perspective and uh, help us to endure, to remain steadfast and to be immovable, to always abound in your work. Because we know that our labor is not in vain if it's done in the Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us to bring you glory. Thank you for these glimpses of, uh, of glory that we're able to see through the life of Stephen and the things that you were able to show and, and use him to, um, to declare. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.